Welcome to the Federal Society's Teleform webinar call as today, April 19th, 2022, we discuss judicial ethics in the modern era. I'm Dean Reuter, Senior Vice President, General Counsel at the, uh, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Also, of course, this call is being recorded, will be used as a podcast, and will likely be transcribed and put on the Federal Society's website. We're very pleased to welcome three experts to our call today. We're gonna to hear opening remarks from each of them. I might have a question or two, but as always, we'll be looking to the audience for questions. So throughout the program, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function in the bottom middle of your screen to ask your question. And we'll try and get to as many of those questions as possible. We're gonna hear first today from Professor Thomas D. Morgan. He's the Oppenheim Professor Emeritus of Antitrust and Law uh, and Trade Regulation Law at the George Washington University Law School. He'll be followed by Professor Michael Krauss, Professor Emeritus of Law at the Antonin Scalia Law School at the George Mason University. And then finally, in opening remarks, we'll hear from, from Professor Rebecca Royfe. She's the tr trustee professor of law and co-dean for faculty scholarship at the New York Law School. Welcome one and all. Um, I think everybody's seen the description for this event. We are talking, I think, trying to uh, have a discussion about judicial ethics in light of some of the recent events. Uh, I wouldn't quite call it breaking news, but events that everybody's hearing about, criticism of one or more justices, uh, the roles of spouses. What does this all mean in terms of judicial ethics? There's a, a particular decision that I think has been raised um, as a point of discussion by many, and that's the 8-1 decision, decision that concerned events on January 6th. Um, that's all I'm going to say in terms of setting the table. I think we're going to have a lively discussion here today uh, with some room for, room for, for disagreement. But um, to, to get us started, Professor Tom Morgan, uh, I know you're going to talk about a number of things in your opening remarks, maybe five or 10 minutes. Um, hopefully, you'll, you'll talk about the, the standards that are in place uh, as well. What, sh what should those standards be? What are they? Uh, but with that, uh, Professor Morgan, please go right ahead. Thanks, Dean. Uh, this is an important topic. It's one that uh, uh, we all care about uh, and uh, uh, one that uh, has a way of moving from uh, the status of a particular justice or decisions of a justice to the court as an institution. So that it's important that we think clearly about the topic. It isn't a modern topic or a uh, a topic that has a partisan uh, uh, cast to it. Uh, as long ago as 1966, uh, we had a justice with a controversial wife. Uh, and uh, that justice helped establish the court's attitude toward uh, the ethical stance, status of uh, justices. Uh, that uh, has pretty much carried the day ever since. Uh, the uh, Justice uh, William O. Douglas was 67 years old uh, when he married Kathy Heffernan, who was 24 and who had strong political convictions uh, consistent with those of the justice. Many Republicans were apoplectic and uh, they had been apoplectic about Justice Douglas before that. Uh, but it was reinforced uh, by this. Justice Douglas said, it is nobody's business what justice's spouse or family uh, do in their personal uh, dealings and their personal conduct. My point is not to deal with Justice Douglas's case or to say that the ethical issues are identical. It's simply to say that the problem of uh, clear understanding and fair treatment of uh, the conduct of Supreme Court justices and judges generally is uh, a critical issue. Like Justice Douglas earlier, the Supreme Court as an institution has taken the position that separation of powers requires that its members not be subject to binding ethical standards. In my view, that position is wrong. First, justices now adhere. One can uh, uh, ask whether uh, they could say they don't have to adhere, but they do adhere. 
to financial reporting standards that apply to all federal employees, uh, including judges, and they concede they're subject to uh, Section 28 USC, Section 455, uh, requiring recusal in a number of settings. Uh, the uh, general proposition is that, that they are required by Section 455 to recuse themselves in any proceeding in which the justices uh, or judges' impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Uh, and the question then becomes what that means and how it applies in this situation. Uh, I would su suggest not that Congress should take action to impose standards on the court, but that the court declare that its justices will follow the code of conduct for United States judges a uh, document adopted by the Judicial Conference of the United States, applicable to all other federal judges, uh, and that uh, bears, that uh, I think virtually everybody agrees is a reasonable set of, of rules. The question of when a judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned is of course where most of this uh, discussion is going to center. And I think the key distinction to keep in mind here is the distinction between whether the justice has a personal interest in or obligation to one or more of the parties uh, versus whether or not the justice has views about significant social and policy issues. All justices have strong views about various uh, public issues, but the requirement of disqualification, as indicated by the whole context of Section 455, is whether or not they have an interest in the result in the case. It's why uh, in her recent uh, confirmation hearings, uh, now uh, about to be Justice Jackson, accepted that she should not participate in a decision involving uh, Harvard, where she is on the board of overseers, but she did not, uh, was not asked to recuse herself uh, in cases involving affirmative action, where presumably she uh, has uh, at least equally strong views. The point is, there is a body of law here, and uh, the rest of the panel, I'm sure, will uh, uh, develop it, that is useful, available uh, to the court. And in my view, the court would do uh, a great service to itself to uh, voluntarily accept the responsibility uh, that all other federal judges uh, face. Professor Krauss, your opening thoughts. Thanks. Um, uh, let me. Um, uh, I'm going to take issue a little bit with something that Tom said. Uh, let me introduce this in a possibly strange way to analogize it to um, public international law. Public international law, does it exist? There are cynics who say, no, it doesn't exist because there's no enforcement mechanism. There's no <laughs> binding rule. There's no sanction that will be applied legally and certainly to violators. I don't think that's true. I think public international law does exist. It's a subject I used to teach. Uh, it exists and it has moral suasion. It exists because people feel bound by it, even if there is no uh, sanction mechanism uh, applicable to deviant states. Uh, similarly, it would be silly to say that the Supreme Court justices are boundless. Um, I understand that Justice uh, that this was said in the, in the 1960s, but uh, it was said by a justice who had the habit of saying perhaps mm. slightly outrageous things occasionally. Uh, even though there's no way to sanction a judge who commits a violation, apart of course from uh, impeachment, which is uh, 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 virtually impossible in this case, it was tried once with Justice Chase, I believe, and didn't succeed, but uh, re really very difficult to conceive of. Um, there's no legal sanction, but there is a sufficient uh, moral sanction 
to uh, impress itself on justices. That being said, uh, let, me, let me state that I, 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 it's not at all clear to me even that Section 455 is legally binding on the Supreme Court, legally binding in the, first of all, of course, it doesn't mention a sanction or a lawsuit or a liability or even discipline. Um, um, uh, it's not clear that, it, it, however, it's reasonable. It is very reasonable and the Supreme Court has chosen quite wisely to abide by it, especially since, as Tom pointed out, uh, some of the verbiage is sufficiently vague to allow a play, uh, really a, a large amount of play. So for example, uh, uh, to hearken way back uh, past uh, the current 8-1 decision that Dean uh, alluded to, um, I recall United States versus Virginia, uh, the case where the Virginia Military in Institute's um, all-male uh, status was successfully challenged in a divided Supreme Court decision. Justice Thomas recused himself from that case, if memory serves, uh, because his son was a student uh, there at the time. Now, it wasn't clear that what his son's views were on uh, sexual segregation at the school, but whatever they were, I don't know what they were, I don't know what they are, but uh, he, Justice Thomas recused himself. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, who wrote the opinion for the court, did not recuse herself, uh, despite her membership and uh, prominent uh, activity in uh, an organiza a nonprofit organization that was one of the prime movers in the challenge to VMI's um, sexual uh, uh, exclusivity or segregation. Um, so we've had these kinds of debates for a, uh, for a while. Uh, much of it depends on what, as Tom pointed out, let me sort of hone in on this uh, as I close my opening remarks, on what we mean by an interest. What is an interest? It can't merely mean an intellectual interest. Otherwise, the only justices that would ever decide cases would be justices that had never thought about the case ever before and that had no interest uh, in the outcome. Uh, it has to, so it clearly does mean a financial interest. Uh, can it mean more than a financial interest? I think it can. And I'll just close with one uh, little example. Let's imagine that instead of inviting Ms. Thomas to appear before the Congressional Committee, the Congressional Committee had issued a subpoena to Ms. Thomas. Um, and then somehow before the Supreme Court came the issue of whether congressional contempt of court uh, was constitutional, whether the Congress had the right to hold people in contempt for um, uh, refusing to comply with a subpoena. Uh, and a subpoena had been issued to Mrs. Thomas. Uh, that would be uh, a sufficient interest in my opinion on the part of Mrs. Thomas to uh, require Justice Thomas to recuse. The, none of that happened in this 8-1 case. And my only wish is that Justice Thomas had spent two or three sentences at the beginning of his dissent to explain why he was not obliged to recuse, much as Justice Scalia did back in the day when he was uh, uh, accused of not recusing himself in a case against Vice President Cheney. Professor Reifey, if you can come off mute, I'd um, love to hear your opening thoughts. Okay, um, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, great. So um, I, I wanna start with the question of what, um, what the standards are and what they should be. So section 455 has both gen a general proposition and then more specific ones. And the general proposition says essentially, you um, ought to recuse yourself when your impartiality can reasonably be questioned. And then there are a list that's not inclusive, but um, not, sorry, not exclusive, that a list of you know specific times in which that exists. So um, both Tom and Michael brought up some of those when you have a personal interest in the outcome of a case, when you are related to a party in the case, when you have a financial interest in the case. Um, so I think the standards that ought to apply, and I think the standards that the justices generally do apply in the cases is that when one of those more specific um, provisions apply, they recuse themselves. However, this more general notion about when your impartiality can reasonably be questioned is somewhat problematic in all in the cases of all judges, but particularly in the case of the Supreme Court. And that's because the, on lower courts, you can always find somebody to sit 
in your place. But on the Supreme Court, you are always balancing um, your, the operational need for the court to proceed. And that operational need is particularly weighty because if one justice recuses himself, then you know you might have a 4-4 tie because there will be an even number of justices remaining. So um, for that reason, and also um, for the ultimate reason about of judicial integrity, which we'll get to in a minute, I think that this more general sense of just generally when your impartiality can be questioned is not really an appropriate standard for the Supreme Court. Um, so then I want to talk for a second about Justice Thomas himself. So um, applying what I think ought to be the standard, I think he ought to have recused himself in the case in which the tranche of emails was at issue. Because if he knew, and again, this is an if, but if he knew that his wife's emails were at issue in that case and that they were going to become public if, or they were going to you know, become an issue if, they, if the um, court case came out in a particular way, that seems like a concrete interest, as Michael was suggesting, that might lead a justice to think that is problematic because I have some kind of reputational interest in what's going on in this case and in the outcome of this case. But on the other side, her passionate interest in um, and belief in you know, certain of the underlying ideological issues um, ought not to be a reason to, for Justice Thomas to recuse himself for two reasons. One, I don't think we in the modern day should think of husbands and wives as one unit. I certainly don't agree with my husband on many issues. I'll say that now in case anybody's listening. Um, and he doesn't agree with me. So, um, you know, I, I think that's that's problematic. And it also is um, in some ways chilling of a spouse of somebody in a public position like Justice Thomas's, and that is problematic. Um, but also, even if these strong beliefs were held by Justice Thomas, which they may well be, I think we have faith in our judiciary. We have to have faith in our judiciary. And the public understands that judges are required to look at the facts and law and to the best of their ability, put their ideological concerns to the side, their personal interests and beliefs to the side and decide the cases in the way that the law um, dictates. And so I, um, I, I think that in the general sense that he ought to recuse himself in all all January 6 related cases is just wrong. And I've heard a lot of legal ethics experts put forward the other position, and I just don't agree with it. And I think it's in fact dangerous, in part because, um, which is my next point, which comes to the integrity of the judiciary, that the in integrity of the judiciary suffers, not only when there's this kind of public remark, but I think possibly even more so when there are public calls, usually from the opposite side of the aisle, for the justice to recuse. And I mean, Tom brought up examples, Michael brought up examples, it's always the ideological opposition that says this justice now needs to recuse. That, I think, casts doubt on the legitimacy of the institution. Um, okay, so finally, I just want to talk about the congressional proposals. And there actually are a wide range of congressional proposals um, to deal with this problem. And many of them are very aware of the separation of powers concerns. But I want to say that I'm very concerned about the separation of powers concerns. I think that the judiciary has, because of a sense of comedy, um, not questioned many of the things that Congress ha has, ha many of the impositions that Congress has put on, financial disclosure, Rule 455, but I think if pushed, there might be a very good um, argument that um, the real way to check the judiciary is through um, salary increases and impeachment. And those are the two mechanisms in the Constitution that Congress has to govern um, the judiciary. And I don't really think that it's appropriate for a co-equal branch to order um, the uh, judiciary to adopt a code of ethics. So then that, that, that leads to Tom's point, well, maybe they should just voluntarily adopt a set of norms. I, I'm in favor of that. I, I, I think it's that leads to a question of, well, how best does a small group of people um, create norms um, within the institution? I don't know that rules are really the best way to do that. I do think informal norms often work better in that context. And I I would definitely leave it up to the Chief Justice to make that call and not, not feel entirely comfortable, even as an outside commentator saying, you know, you have to do this for the sake of the integrity of the judiciary, because I think his familiar- In terms of, um, you know, required ethics as opposed to suggested ethics and standards? Professor Morgan? Well, I think the, uh, it's clear that Congress has the authority to regulate the conduct of lower court federal judges, right. just because it creates the lower courts. But uh, the uh, 
I, I think the standards, the substantive standards, <laughs> are uh, should be the same in, in each case. So just to complete the thoughts that I was making in, in partial answer to Michael and Rebecca, uh, the uh, what I would suggest is that when a uh, justice receives uh, a suggestion or hears about it even uh, about uh, that they should recuse themselves in a pending matter. Uh, the justice ought to write a short memorandum circulated to the other members of the court. If three of those justices, uh, and it's, that's not a magic number, but it's less than four, and it's, uh, uh, it's some, not just a single person, uh, said that the, they believe the justice uh, should reconsider and that in fact, the justice should uh, recuse himself or herself, then that the, uh, the matter could be set uh, for hearing by the full court and that the court could uh, prevent the justice from sitting. My own view is that you'd never get that far. That gets back to the internal workings of the court, the idea of, of uh, uh, congeniality and uh, uh, I think that realistically you'd never get that far but the public would have a sense that there is a systematic way in which justices consider what it is they ought to be doing when it is they ought to be recused from a matter uh, and I don't view that as threatening I do view congressional intervention as threatening because I think those, uh, I think the motives and uh, uh, indeed incentives uh, uh, on uh, the, the uh, congressmen and senators uh, could be uh, antithetical to uh, appropriate separation of powers. Professor Krause, I'm going to come back to you. Is there is there consensus that there's really a problem here now, or even you know in the in, in the modern era, uh, do we have a problem that needs fixing? Are the justices getting it done uh, by themselves? I mean, you see recusals with you know at least not infrequently uh, by Supreme Court justices. They're they're aware of of standards certainly. Um, yes, there's a problem. The problem is a subset of the problem of the politicization of the court that has endured ever since perhaps the Bork uh, confirmation hearings. Um, and I think these things bubble up in many different ways and um, uh, arguable recusal is one of the ways in which this has bubbled up after a judge's confirmation. Mostly of course it bubbles up before a confirmation but once it's done, the confirmation is done there are different ways to attack and recusal is one of them. Um, I mostly agree with essentially everything that Professor Royfe said. I, I, let me, let me uh, elaborate a, a gloss on this a little bit and link it up to a comment that Tom made. Um, you know, we, the Supreme Court does have all sorts of norms. I'm not exactly uh, sure exactly what they are. And I, it, these are sociological norms that it's hard to write down if you've not been in, an insider. I have a, a child who's been an insider and uh, who refuses to talk to me too much about some of these things for reasons of conf quite good reasons of confidentiality. But I do recall uh, knowing about what happened to Justice Douglas when he was uh, towards the end of his career, when he was mentally, let, let us say, mentally incapacitated to some extent. Uh, there's no formal rule about this, but the Supreme Court took care of this in informal ways that preserved the collegiality. And uh, you know, those who are interested can easily find literature talking about this. So I won't elaborate too much, just to say that I think that similarly, if you get an outrageous violation of recusal standards, we probably already have norms in place, sociological norms in place to deal with this without having to re have recourse possibly to the objective, say three justice uh, rule to, 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 uh, um, that, that might lead to the increasing politicization uh, for all I know. Um, one last, uh, the, only, the only other gloss I'll make is that, is that the, the code of conduct that applies express, expressly to all federal judges except the Supreme Court was, as was mentioned, I think by Tom, a, a product of the judicial conference, which is almost exclusively 
composed of inferior judges, circuit and district court judges. Um, and it would, be, uh, um, it would be remarkable if those folks could have a binding effect on the Supreme Court of the United States. So there is one Supreme Court that they are the Supreme Court. They're not bound by lower courts. Um, another reason to, to let them handle it, I, I, I see no evidence that they've been really poorly handling it. And I'll close with that. Professor Royfi, I want to pick up on something you said and then and give you a chance to expand if you want. Um, and that is the, the problem of making, I guess, or bringing accusations or claims uh, against the court and how the, how the institution might suffer from that problem. Um, uh, we've seen, I, I guess, in, in the recent uh, years, uh, some attacks on the court. I would describe them as attacks on, on the way the court uh, uses its processes. What can you say, if you will, for a minute, uh, focus on what that means if you're a lawyer doing that. As a lawyer, uh, presumably you have a duty to report illicit conduct by a judge, uh, but do you have a corresponding duty to be, what's the level of care you need to make as a lawyer bringing an accusation against a, a sitting justice or judge? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And it goes back, I think, to something that you were saying before, which is about the public perception of the court. So, you know, what is it that, you know, I agree that the public perception of the court has suffered, um, you know, since, since Bork, you know, I, I think that's a good enough place to put our marker. Um, so what to do about that problem? So, you know, one thing that we could do is we could say more recusal is, ne is necessarily better. That will help the public perception of the court just anytime there could possibly be anybody thinks that there, you know, there's a public clamor, like just get out. I don't think that that's right. I think that in fact will um, reinforce the notion that judges are political and just simply deciding things politically. So not more recusal. Um, uh, how about um, more transparency? I actually think more transparency, Tom's suggestion, I'm fully on board. More transparency, better, right? Just let us know what's going on and give us an explanation. I think that helps no matter what. Um, Okay, and then your, to your final point, which is about commentators, I actually think commentators, and I, I don't, I mean, my position is more as an outsider than, a, than as, a, as a lawyer, but I, I do think for one, certainly if you're not representing a client um, and you are a public commentator, an expert, um, like one of any of the three of us on this panel, like one has an obligation to confront one's own biases because I do think that, you know, you see people and they aren't being honest brokers, right? I mean, they're consistently making comments that are serving a their own political agenda. And to me, that adds to this notion of politics. There is no such thing as neutrality. It's like everybody's on a side fighting. All the justices must be on a side fighting. You've said the court has become completely degraded, you know, and exaggerated your claim in order to make a point. So, so my, so my position is, I suppose, definitely neutral commentators um, have an obligation to try their best to be neutral um, and unbiased in the way they apply these rules. And even lawyers have an obligation to tone down the rhetoric and actually think about, you know, identifying real, uh, real, that um, real points at which a judge has um, not abided by his ethical responsibility and um, ask for consequences based on the law, the body of law that's out there, because otherwise we have this sense that ethics is like this loose thing that we can just use as a weapon against our political enemies. And I think we all need to to take a step back and only use ethics when it's it, at least to call for consequences when it's 100% supported by the case law, the rules, the way the rules are consistently applied in the past. Uh, Professor Krauss or Morgan, any any thoughts on on those issues? Amen. I, I certainly agree with the uh, advisability of writing a one paragraph memo to one's colleagues indicating, you know, uh, I've, I've had calls for me to recuse and here is why I'm not recusing. Um, I think that's great. Uh, maybe that's, I, I mean, maybe that's done right now, but in a less formal way. Um, it may well be done in a less formal way and, and maybe that is fine. Maybe the court does not see the problem that the general public sees. And, um, you know, there were, uh, in the case of Justice Thomas, um, um, he has been the object of uh, criticism um, for a long time um, by those who did not favor his uh, 
appointment to the court in the first place. So it, um, in his case, perhaps I can explain his lack of just public justification for not recusing himself by the fact that he's he, he's been, he, he's had so many darts thrown at him over the years that it's not unreasonable for him to uh, just um, um, put on blinders and, 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 uh, and ignore them. I'm gonna to get to the audience questions uh, soon. Uh, one thing I think our description mentioned is a free speech issue. I don't know if it explicitly mentions that or not, but uh, held here presumably by um, uh, Justice Thomas's wife, uh, it's been said that you know husbands and wives don't necessarily agree. They often disagree. Um, what, are there free speech considerations? How does this weigh? Um, what do we have to say about um, spouses of justices, not just judges, but justices giving up a public persona or even uh, a public job uh, or their personal views? Uh, what, what are, how does that weigh in here or does it? I think it's a red herring issue, uh, Dean. Uh, that is to say, I don't think anybody who thinks seriously about this thinks that Mrs. Thomas does not have the right to speak on issues. Obviously, if she engages in uh, criminal uh, activity, uh, she is subject uh, to the law like anybody else. But uh, the fact that she has strongly held views on this or any other issue um, is, uh, I, I don't think is, there's any serious argument that she doesn't have the right to speak. The question is whether what she says or the issues on which she chooses to speak uh, have an impact on uh, Justice Thomas's uh, obligations to recuse. And I think the, uh, the answer to that is uh, if she were saying I think that X ought to win uh, a particular case before the court. Uh, uh, it would be a closer matter, but even there, probably uh, uh, it uh, the the statute and and indeed uh, I think any reasonable set of rules would not make public statements by a uh, justice's spouse a basis for. Uh, recusal on a general policy, on a general question. I guess I would jump in and, and say, I, I don't know that I see it quite as much as a, a red herring as you do, Tom, because, you know, certainly I think, you know, most people, many people who are concerned about professional speech of judges say recusal is a better mechanism, for instance, than rules that just directly limit you know, what judges can say. And I'm of that opinion too. If a judge goes and gives a speech at a forum, I'm not concerned. And I think that should be protected. Um, but the question is always when it comes to speech, what is the link um, between limiting that speech and a valid government interest? And in recusal, you say it's pretty obvious the link is so that we can be sure that they're not being biased. It's the integrity of the judiciary. That's a compelling government interest. But when we get to the point of, um, it's about whether their integrity can reasonably be questioned. Then I start to think, you know, in the shadow of the First Amendment, I don't know, because that's such a vague government interest. And I don't know what would be narrowly tailored to achieve that, because some of the things that people think are so obviously furthering it, to me, I worry that those things are, in fact, undermining it. And it's really hard to prove. So I, 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 again, I, I think you're right. It's not a major First Amendment issue because of the posture of these cases. But I also think professional speech is really important. And then when we're one step away and we're talking about the justice's wife's speech reflecting on his ability to sit, I do think that that it would ultimately, if we if we required recusal under those circumstances, that would chill spouses from saying things, from being a part politically active where they want to be politically active. And that's troubling. It's troubling in the modern era where we don't have, you know, spouses who just sit at home and take care of children. And most, most in, in many to most couples, there, there are two people who are active in public life. I'll just add that um, we have an example, relatively recent example, not of a spouse, but of a justice herself, 
who intervened uh, publicly to express a very strong opinion. We can all remember the late and regretted uh, Justice Ginsburg, uh, who made a speech. I, I don't have it in front of me, but if I recall, she said that uh, you know one of the candidates for president was a faker, was a fraud, and that um, and she wouldn't want to live in a country under this uh, person, uh, who was then subsequently um, elected. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, what should happen if um, uh, one of uh, that president's uh, uh, signature policies was brought before the court, if its constitutionality was uh, questioned, should that justice recuse herself? I don't recall Justice Ginsburg indicating that she planned to recuse herself every time this would happen. I don't think that that is what occurred. And I guess I'd like to come back to the text of 455A that that, that section that's really not very much applied, but that, that states the basic, basic genus of it all. And that is that it's not that your integrity is questioned, it's that your impartiality might reasonably be questioned. So I suppose that Justice Ginsburg, were she with us uh, today, would say, well, you know, no, I, it's one thing, what I think of this man is one thing, but, but I'm, I'm perfectly capable of impartially looking at his legislation uh, and determining whether his legislation violates uh, the Constitution as I interpret it, uh, and I'm bound in my interpretations by my vision of the Constitution and by precedent, etc. Uh, so, uh, if if the if 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 the justice herself can be as expressive as Justice Ginsburg was, then it doesn't even seem to be a close question whether the spouse of a justice uh, it, it can opine on these matters. It it just seems an easy case for me. But I don't know if the uh, if our experts can see the questions in the in the Q&A function, um, but we're, we're going to turn to some of those now. If you see one that you like, feel free to speak up uh, uh, and, and interject. Um, there's a question from Gabe Roth. I'll read it. Waiting for the justices to impose an ethics code is akin to waiting for Godot. Uh, the choices are do nothing or ask Congress either to write a code for the justices themselves or to write a law that says either write a code yourself or we'll take away your discretionary budget of $143 million. Uh, do, do you see either of those as possible and, or do we just continue on um, under the status quo, either threatening, threatening uh, the court's discretionary budget? I mean, I'll jump in and say I, I I don't think those are options. You know, I I I mean, you know, I, I think that you know some of the ways in which um, you know the the some of the proposals are worded, they're worded so carefully. They they say like we would urge the court, <laughs> we suggest the court, and I I'm okay with that. I mean, have a conversation either through legislation or you know pick up the phone and say you know you should probably do this and. I, you know, that seems okay to me. Ordering a co-equal branch to do something like that or threatening them doesn't seem appropriate. And there are all sorts of problems that are end up being somewhat um, frustratingly unsolved because we have this system of checks and balances. And so I'm sympathetic with the frustration, but I sort of think we're stuck with it in a lot of situations. I mean, think about how, on a totally different topic, like how, how, how frustrated people were when like Congress couldn't enforce its subpoenas, you know, and we're like, where's the court and why can't, and it, it, it you know, it is frustrating when you think, you know, this is the law and it's not being enforced, but I, you know, sometimes the medicine is worse than the disease. And to me, um, you know, really pushing at the walls of the separation of powers is just not a smart idea. Professor Krause or Morgan. Um, I don't think the problem is as a, the, the solution proposed seems drastic to me. Yeah. Uh, drastic solutions uh, should only be considered when there's an acute and drastic problem. And I don't see the problem being as drastic as the comment implies that it is. I do, I do see another, you asked, Dean, you asked if we could- Please, go ahead. In with another. I yes. see another one. I don't know if it, it intrigues my, my, my two colleagues the way it intrigues me, and that is by uh, Christopher Aquilina at 1.23 p.m. And he says, um, you know, his problem is, uh, is, is related, is a first cousin to the recusal. And that's the person who says at the confirmation hearings, um, I think white, and then uh, when it comes to vote, says, I vote black, uh, even though I sort of said I was going to vote white. What do we do about that? 
Um, and that's sort of a tricky uh, issue. First of all, uh, the way, uh, so my answer is sort of twofold. First of all, in confirmation hearings these days, very rarely do you see justices say, or prospective justices say, I think white. Uh, I, they, here's what I think on this issue. Rather, they say, uh, thanks to Justice Ginsburg and the precedent that she created about this, I really can't answer these questions. Now, we may suspect very strongly what he or she would say on an issue, but they don't really say it. I think the, I, so, so let me, I don't know Mr. Aquilina at all, but let me uh, hazard a guess as to what he's talking about. People have often said, you know, there's the, uh, there's, there are all these Georgetown um, uh, 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 cocktail parties and you attend enough of these Georgetown cocktail parties and, and you start to absorb uh, the Washington Post editorial page as, 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 as the uber constitution. And, and so you start to modify your views on things. Um, I, and, and, and so I don't think, if, if that's what is being discussed here, if that's what's really happening here, uh, um, then I don't think that is a problem that is resolvable by any other than structural means, some of which I'd be in favor of. I, I, I wouldn't have been, I, I wouldn't be opposed to an amendment saying that at age, you know, 75 or, or 80 or whatever, um, the term expires of, the, of, of, of a justice and a new justice will be made. Um, that, that would be dependent on something objective like age and not something like what one thinks, how, how one's views on the matter have, uh, have changed. So uh, again, I think um, um, searching for a, a pinpoint answer to these, to these problems, I think it's much more complex and subtle. Anyone else on that question? We've talked a, a couple of times, I've, I've heard the term co-equal branch and, and Congress's ability vis-a-vis -a, -vis a co equal branch. Um, is it really any co equal branch or is it the judiciary in particular? I mean, does, does the judiciary need to be more independent from uh, the legislative branch than does the executive branch? Doesn't the, the legislative branch exercise all sorts of uh, powers over the executive? Just what, what is it about the judiciary, if that's true? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it goes to what we've been talking about this whole time, which is politicization and, um, you know, the judiciary. The point is that if a political branch has control over the judiciary, then there could be um, repercussions that come from powerful political groups um, when a judge rules a certain way. And that seems like an obvious threat to um, the integrity of the judicial branch. And so when we talk about these other threats, threats in terms of the perception and, and so forth, we have to think about weighing it against this other concern, which is what's at stake um, in the separation of powers here. So I think that's an excellent point that you really um, brought up there. Anybody else? Another, another, t Professor Morgan, were you going to say something? No, I, I was, I, I've been tentative here because I had been talking to a, uh, a member of Congress uh, who had some, some influence, uh, who said, you know, the thing I uh, worry about is that the judges will kind of get their act together on these issues uh, so that we in Congress don't have uh, things to uh, uh, get upset about <laughs> in connection with the courts. Uh, one of the reasons I'm encouraging the courts to get there, uh, get on top of these issues, is that I think that it will moderate the need for other solutions. And one of the reasons we're seeing such a collection of kind of oddball things that uh, people want Congress to do is that there is this lack of sense that uh, the courts are taking the matter seriously. I think if they do that, then they can more readily step back into the position of real moral authority. Uh, when a court ex exercise issues a, a, a decision, it has to rely on the executive branch uh, to uh, enforce it in many cases. Uh, and it has to have a, a level of, of moral authority that uh, gives 
its independent status uh, force and effect. And so that's why I'm, I'm uh, with Rebecca that you don't uh, pass this legislation, uh, but I'm still over here saying, let's take away the, the basis on which we get this kind of crazy talk uh, sometimes because uh, uh, people don't, uh, aren't confident the, the courts are taking it serious. Also, I mean, you, you know, one thing to bear in mind is what's the enforcement mechanism of any of these proposals that could actually go into effect with regard to recusal. I mean, recusal, even for lower court judges, is not a disciplinary um, question. It's a question that is reviewed by the individual judge and then reviewed on appeal. So what would you do with regard to the Supreme Court? You could have, I suppose, some Supreme Court, but even that seems like it has some constitutional problems. And if you give power to the Judicial Conference, you're basically giving power to lower courts to regulate the highest court you know, constitutionally of the land. So that seems problematic. So, you know, what are we left with? And I mean, you know, to me, honestly, it, it, the only solution I think is for the Supreme Court to do something on its own. And, you know, I, I suppose I'm, I'm a little more reticent, maybe even than Tom about saying exactly what they should do that, you know, in other words, I, I, having not sat uh, as a justice, having not, you know, it's an institution which that I'm familiar with only from, you know, the outside, and I don't really know how do we create norms, how do we um, encourage all of the members to follow those norms? Is it a code? Is it, a, I mean, it's certainly transparency. You know, I think certainly transparency, but beyond that, I don't, I don't really know what the right answer is. I agree that the we don't want a situation where the judicial conference somehow gangs up on the Supreme Court. Uh, what I was trying to suggest is that the judicial conference is a very well uh, recognized and uh, uh, very uh, conscientious uh, body. Uh, they have a very thorough, a very complete set of rules. If the Supreme Court says we adopt the rules that govern federal judges accept that. Uh, we don't have uh, the uh, circuit uh, committees that can uh, discipline a, uh, a judge in that circuit. And therefore, this is how we're going to do it at the level of the Supreme Court, or that a given rule doesn't apply to, to members of the Supreme Court for the following reasons. I could understand that. And in that sense, you could imagine the Supreme Court writing its own rules. But realistically, I think the simple direct solution is to uh, simply uh, make the, uh, have the court say, we consider ourselves uh, uh, subject to ethical standards. Uh, they're outlined in the code of conduct uh, for United States judges. Uh, and uh, here is how we're gonna do it do it with, in my view, a series of memoranda uh, and uh, uh, an internal process uh, that will guarantee that a substantial majority of the court believes uh, with the justice that uh, recusal is not required. While um, we're talking about these things, let me uh, float another trial balloon. We actually have in the country, uh, a certain number of retired justices. The number varies, of course, over time, but they are there. Um, why couldn't they? I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking out loud. Why couldn't they be used to fill? Uh, Rebecca was exactly right that one of the reasons why Supreme Court justices are loath to recuse is because there's nobody to replace them unlike a circuit court judge and unlike a district court judge. But to the contrary, there actually is a potential body of people who have been approved uh, by uh, the Senate um, as Supreme Court justices. They are there. Sometimes perhaps there might not be any with us, but, there, but usually there are some. And could they be called on? Um, is that, if that were the case, if they could be called on, if legislation were such that they could be called on to fill the gap, would there be more recusals? That's a very interesting 
uh, question I think that we could think about. My guess would be at the margin, there would be more recusals because people would be less afraid of a tied court. The question that came in at 131, and I observe Professor Krauss has a baseball poster in, in, in behind him. And I, I've always heard that you know the most vociferous, most brazen managers, when they go out to argue a call, they're, they're not really looking to affect that call. They're arguing for the next call in the future. The question that comes in at 131 sort of alludes to a chilling factor, that there's a campaign against Clarence Thomas in particular, and that, it, that it's a long game maybe of of trying to affect his behavior one way or another or constrain him. Maybe there's a chilling effect on spouses uh, with accusations like this. Um, have we talked about the, the chilling effect of some of these, uh, um, uh, I don't know, accusation is too hard a word maybe, but uh, some of these goings on and, and what, what, do, uh, what do our experts think about the possible chilling effect on the institution? Well, in the case of Justice Thomas, You've got somebody who uh, is uh, the most senior associate justice. He's been on the court a long time. He's no longer the young man that he was when he was appointed to the court. And so I do think that there is a view that if you keep piling on, if you keep piling and piling and piling on, at some point, he will say, the heck with it. It's not worth it. Um, that might have been less likely 20 years ago, but today is today. And so, yes, I do think it's not, it's not coincidental that there were calls for Justice Thomas to uh, resign because of age, and at the same time, um, this accusation that he should have recused himself. Uh, um, does that mean that there's some kind of explicit conspiracy as opposed to a whole bunch of people thinking roughly the same way about strategy, I think it's more likely the latter. But if those are, I mean, if those are lawyers bringing these cases with the, with, and what's animating, not, not cases, but, uh, and that's what's animating their complaints is, is a, a campaign to get a justice to, to retire or to recuse. Um, what, what does that say about some of the earlier points we were talking about the responsibilities of lawyers vis-a-vis -vis the, the court in, in policing the conduct of the court, but doing so in good faith? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and just say I agree with the implications of your question, which is, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think there's a real tone question in which, you know, we're, we're, what we're talking about is, of course, holding people who are in positions of power to account is something that we should always do, but there's a point at which it becomes so frantic, the call, and so um, one-sided that it ends up um, possibly doing more harm than good. And I do think, you know, harm to the institution. I don't think the institution benefits if, you know, if Justice Thomas feels in some way cowed. Now, he has an obligation not to be cowed, and I don't think there's much indication that he would be cowed. But, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I do think one should think about one's motives. And I also think it's just one of those things that can happen below the surface, like people of really good meaning, just it's like, where did your eyes go? Like, where, why do, why are you only noticing this when it comes to Justice Thomas? Just pause for a second, because there are a lot of like, you know, people even, you know, I've seen comments who are, you know, good, honest brokers who are noticing this on both sides of the aisle, who are careful to be even handed about what they're doing. If you, if you only notice at the abuses of somebody who's your political adversary, I would just pause for a second and think why. Maybe it's only drawing my attention when it comes from that one person. And I think that 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 people who have a megaphone should be careful about that. Not, you know, again, not that they should be, you know, quieted or silenced or anything like that. But I do think it, you know, just as a matter of, um, of practice, it would be good if people thought about that and the potential effect it could have. Great. Well, we've got about five minutes left. I want to give each of you a chance to uh, express a final thought. We'll go in the same order we did when we opened. There's a lot of questions uh, still on the table if anybody <laughs> wants to take a bite at one of those. Uh, but a final thought, Professor Morgan. Well, uh, Dean, I think that uh, I've had uh, uh, plenty of opportunity to, to spell out my uh, views. I do think that uh, the question's important. I think it's non-political in the sense that uh, both sides, uh, lawyers from both sides, people from both sides uh, 
can uh, present the problem and can be as blind uh, uh, or focused as uh, uh, Rebecca was suggesting in, uh, in being improper. But I do think there's a solution. I think the court uh, appropriately uh, should uh, take it on itself to acknowledge the uh, need to uh, follow some systematic ethical uh, analysis of questions presented, uh, to share the obligation of voting on uh, recusal uh, with their fellow members of the court, not simply treat that as uh, an individual matter for the justice. And I think if they do that, we'll be moving in the right direction. Professor Kraus, final thought? Yeah, I mean, just to summarize some of the threads in this really interesting hour, it's been interesting for me. Uh, so some people use recusal uh, motions as strategic ammunition uh, uh, for future cases or, or maybe to wear down a judge. Um, some people feel to the contrary, and I'm looking at a couple of these comments right now, that, you know, it's, it's sort of like the police. You can't, you, they'll always defend themselves and you ask for a, you, 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 won't, you can't even ask for recusal of a lower court judge because they'll, they'll turn you down and then, then they'll be biased against you for the rest of the trial. And if it goes up to appeal, uh, gosh, they'll, they'll always protect each other. And so you've got the, you've, you've got the idea that, that there are too few recusal requests as opposed to too many recusal requests. Um, so this is really um, an issue that is extraordinarily complex. And I'll just close by saying that I, I once spoke to, a, he's deceased now, Ninth Circuit Judge, Judge Noonan, whom many of you may remember, who very famously in, the, in, a, in a Ninth Circuit case called Coda Spotty had been asked to recuse himself. This was a case about, a, about the constitutionality of laws that prohibit um, protests around abortion clinics. They'd asked him to recuse himself because he's a devout Roman, he was a devout Roman Catholic who had written articles before he became a judge on the evils of abortion. And he declined to recuse himself, quite correctly in my opinion, uh, talked about religious tests. I spoke to him at a conference afterwards and he said, um, you know, I really thought about resigning. That was so disgusting. That that hurt me so badly that I came close there to saying it's just a tax on me that's too high. So let's keep that in mind that um, that that's a possible negative side effect here. Professor Reifi, a final thought? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say I think we're weirdly caught between two views of judging, like this sort of old traditional view that judges sit in this box and like, you know, are completely isolated them and their, you know, stay at home wives are completely isolated from the world and don't have any don't have any you know, political views and only call balls and strikes and a more nuanced understanding of what judging is. And that's part of why we're doing such a bad job at promoting the um, integrity of the judiciary. And I think that some of the proposals that um, my co-panelists have suggested are actually very good ways of um, trying to remedy that, you know, transparency standards. I, I think that that's absolutely true. I don't think the public is incapable of understanding this basic idea, which is judges have be all sorts of views. They have political beliefs, very, oftentimes very strong ones, and then they can still sit on cases and it doesn't mean they're doing exactly what politicians are doing. And so I think in order to, to save the reputation of the Supreme Court and lower courts too, we need to figure out a way through judi judicial ethics rules and otherwise of promoting that, that kind of realistic notion of what judges do. Well, we are on the hour, and I want to thank our experts for the discussion. I think this has been fascinating. I've learned a lot myself, and I appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness. Also, thanks to the audience. Sorry we didn't get to more of your questions, but uh, I think we did cover a lot of territory. A reminder to the audience to check your emails and monitor the Federal Society website for upcoming uh, events. But until that next event, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.